Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Carrick Butler, the pastor of Faith Christian Center. Thanks for tuning in today. We believe today's message is going to help you live this lifestyle of faith. It's going to empower you to live a life that makes Jesus famous wherever you go. Open up your heart. We know God has something special just for you. And we believe that as you listen to today's message, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up. I'll talk to you today at the end of our broadcast. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read this in a couple versions. Start with the King James here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your worship service. So let's let this thought hit us, because when we use the word sacrifice in today's culture, we don't always think of what they meant as sacrifice in that culture. We think about if we sacrifice, that meant we put some extra effort in and we didn't do stuff we wanted to do so that someone else could have what they wanted, right? We sacrifice for our children. We sacrifice for our grandchildren. We sacrifice for others, right? Out of the love that's in our heart and the love of Christ that compels us. But when he's talking about the word sacrifice here, that is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the times when they would go into ancient temples and bring a physical sacrifice. Sometimes it was an animal. Sometimes it was grain. Sometimes it was a drink offering. And they would bring that sacrifice and present it to God and leave it there. Now, how many know the priest would probably look at you sideways if you brought an offering, left it on the altar, presented it to God, and picked it back up and walked out? How many know you got some priests looking at you sideways in their holy garments going, what in the world is you doing? If it's a sacrifice and you bring it to the altar, you're supposed to leave it. And so Paul is saying, you need to consider your life, consider your body a living sacrifice. Because sacrifices, you killed it, you left it there, you're done. No, Paul says, it's a living sacrifice, you need to keep yourself on that altar. Look at someone across the aisle and say, keep yourself on that altar. Because sometimes in Christianity, we have this habit of, oh, I'm on the altar on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, let me get myself back right. Wednesday, someone cut me off on 20. Thursday, I'm back on the altar. Friday, ooh, did you see what that politician said? Or let me go a little bit further. Did you see what they said in that trial? Did you see that video of that shooting? Oh, I'm getting all up in your lives today. So just, it's like, oh, you stepped on my foot. Well, pull your feet back in. We have a habit of putting ourselves on the altar and taking ourselves off when it suits us. And that is not what the scripture says. A living sacrifice, meaning we have to keep ourselves on the altar. Say, keep yourself on the altar. Paul continues and says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing or the renovation of your mind. When you renovate something, what do you do? You take out the old and you put in the new. And so even if you've been saved 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60, you got to get 70, 80, you've been saved a long time, you still have to renovate your mind because there's a lot of other things trying to get in your mind. And so you have to stay on guard to make sure you're thinking according to the word of God. We live in a generation, if it's catchy and it's a mean, people think it's true. And you know, so all those young people, oh no, it's a whole lot of people's. Just because it's a meme on Facebook doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's on TV doesn't mean it's true. Just because it comes from your favorite news personality doesn't mean it's true. You have to check every single thought with the Word of God. As we talked about in our earlier series this year, you need to take every single thought captive. Well, pastor, that's work. Yeah, it is. But if you want to think godly and have a renovated mind, so that you can be transformed into who God wants you to be, you have to control your thought life. Because if you don't, somebody else will. The enemy, the person you just can't stand, the news media, somebody is going to control your mind if you don't control it for yourself. Say, my mind is my mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly according to as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And we'll get into that maybe later today or next week. But let's look back at verse 2 in the Amplified Classic Edition. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Another translation, the message version says it this way. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now, doing a lot of review today. If you missed part 1, I encourage you to look it up on the Faith Plus app or on YouTube. James chapter 4, verse 7. One of the things we covered last week is that in order to do this, we have to have an absolute standard of truth. And in this day and age, a lot of things aren't absolute. You know, we live in a day and age where, you know, live your truth. That's a common phrase. But there is something still as the absolute truth, and it's the word of God. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We talk about submit to God. We're talking about yield to God's will. Yield to God's plan for your life. Yield to God's word. Believe what he has to say about the matter. But what if that celebrity doesn't agree with it? Well, how many know the celebrity? They may be nice. They may be a good person, but they can't save you. What about that politician? If they don't agree, well, they can't save you either. What about Big Mama? Well, I'm sure she's nice, but she can't save you either. Are you going to believe the word of God or not? How easily will you let someone change your mind about the word and tell you, well, that's not for today? Well, we've moved beyond that. We're progressive now. Well, some good areas is good to progress in, but you don't progress from the word of God. Because if you try to leave the word, you open yourself up to deception. And what's worse than a person who's wrong is a deceived person. Because you can't tell a deceived person they're wrong. They will, for the rest of their life, believe they're right. But anytime we look at God's word and we say, well, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. We open ourselves up to deception. And the enemy can lead us away. Now, you may keep all the good Christian cliches. You may look saved, sanctified with a mighty burning fire. But you're deceived because you begin to take other things as standards for the truth. And we so often may not look to some other document. We look to our emotions, our feelings. Have you let your emotions take you off the altar? You got caught up in your feelings and you left the altar. You see, emotions aren't bad. You are a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will and the control center of your emotions, and you live in a physical body. You're supposed to have emotions. You're not supposed to let your emotions have you. You're supposed to have emotions, but you're not supposed to let your emotions have you. Because when you let your emotions have you, you'll make unwise decisions. How many know that? How many have ever made stupid decisions because you were caught up in your feelings? So it would behoove us to make sure our emotions are in control. And if we're going to make sure our emotions are in control, we should probably make sure our mouth isn't in control. How many of you have ever done something stupid because you didn't shut this? Your mouth is a good indicator of where you are. Your mouth will tell on you, literally. 
And so you say, well, what, how should I respond? Just shh. Not everything needs you to respond immediately or post immediately or tweet immediately or TikTok immediately or whatever. You can pause. Everybody does not have to need to know what you're thinking. They don't. I must post on it. Says who? Did the Holy Ghost say you must post on it right now? Oh, you did it? Then you chill a little bit. You're hot. You probably shouldn't say anything if you're that hot. You should probably take a moment and chill. People around say, well, what are you thinking? Well, I'm trying to stay safe right now, so I'm just going to be quiet for a moment. Check in with the Holy Ghost on the inside. Sir, how should I respond to this foolishness? And you're real with the Holy Ghost. Don't be fake. Oh, Holy Ghost, I'm not that angry. You know you're angry. You know you're hot. He knows you're hot. You know you're hot. So stop pretending. Sir, I am hot right now. Did you see that ratchetness? Did you see that? <sighs> be honest. Be real with him and ask him for his help. And he will help you. And it will astonish your, your response. You'll respond in such love. You're like, where did that come from? You know that was God. You know that was not you. Because you responded in love when your flesh will say, knock him out, knock him out, knock him out. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. The word resist means to withstand. It means to stand against. It means to oppose. It means to set yourself against. Resist means to withstand. It means to stand against. It means to oppose. It means to set yourself against. The word flee here means to flee away, to seek safety by flight, to escape. So this mentions the devil running from you in stark terror, trying to escape you. You have no business running from the devil. The devil should be running from you. Now, if he's not running from you, then maybe you're not resisting. It's hard to resist someone when you agree with their lifestyle. It's hard to resist someone when you agree with his philosophy. That's why first to submit yourselves, therefore, to God, then resist the devil. Because at this point, you've yielded to God's word, God's way, God's plan, God's purpose is thinking on the matter. You believe what he says, and now you're able to resist the devil. Well, pastor, how long do I have to resist him? Until he runs. Whether that's five seconds or five years, you outlast the devil. Some of you, and some of us, we resist when it's convenient, when we feel like it. And then, well, I resist it for a couple of days, it should be done. Spiritual things don't always work like our Wi-Fi connections. You know, we expect it should load like this. I got a multiple gigabyte file, it should be done in a few seconds. That's what we expect these days. But back in the 90s, when he got that CD in the mail, and he put it in, and he had that dial-up tone. I got some young people like, dial-up tone? What are you talking about? It's okay. It's a while ago. And you waited for a while until you could hear, you got mail. But now, if something takes longer than 10 seconds, we upset. Let me call them because I spend too much money to have slow internet. And sometimes we take that mentality to spiritual matters. Well, I resisted for a few seconds. Why didn't it change? Now, what if you've been living like this for 30 years? Do you really think resisting for two seconds changes everything? How I many know it takes time? But you have to make a decision that you'll resist every day of your life if it takes that. You make, make a decision, I'm going to make a stand. That no matter what the enemy says or does, I resist him. And he will flee from me. To join the resistance, you will have to make a stand against the enemy. Often it may make you seem like an alien to the culture. But you have to stand and live for God anyways. We talked about what Jesus said last week. He says, talking about us, he says, they're not of the world, just like I'm not of the world. 
You know, we celebrate every Christmas how Jesus is not of the world, how he came and was born as a baby in a manger, right? We all know Jesus is not of this world. And Jesus said, you are not of the world, just like he's not of the world. But when we consider ourselves as only mere humans, we do ourselves a disadvantage. When we consider ourselves, well, I'm just here to live however long and just go. No. If you identify wrong, you won't be able to resist. That's why the enemy will try to identify you and give you an identity. Whether it's through the words of people as you're young, the words of teachers, the words of family members, the words of the media, the words of music, whatever. He'll try to identify you so that you don't receive what God has for you. It's hard to resist the enemy when you've accepted his labels. Now today we're going to talk about in this message how not to let your struggle define you, nor consume you. Because too often we identify with our struggle. We identify with what we're fighting against, and we let that define ourselves. One of the things we talked about last week that you need to keep in the forefront of your thinking. When you make a stand for God, expect supernatural assistance. Usually when we talk about making a stand for God, so well, get ready for opposition. Get ready for persecution. Get ready for affliction. Yes, we all know that. But what we don't often expect is supernatural assistance. So now we programmed ourselves to expect trauma instead of heavenly help. What is your expectation? Are you expecting bad things come in threes? Or are you expecting miracles? Are you expecting God's divine intervention? When you make a stand for God, expect supernatural assistance. When you make a stand for God, expect supernatural assistance. And if you are going to resist, you will need to represent and identify correctly. If you are going to resist, you're going to need to represent and identify correctly. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How many know if you let your enemy identify you, he'll always identify you as something you're not? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let me start with verse 14. For the love of Christ constrains us, because thus we judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he that died for all, that they which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto God which died for him, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, because he died for us and rose again, and because we should live for him, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Say new creature. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Those watching online, say new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So let's break that down. What became new when he became in Christ? Was it your body? No. No, we have songs like, well, I went up to the altar and my... Hands felt new, my feet felt new, my wig felt new, the weed felt new too. But just because it's a song that you like doesn't mean it's true. Your body didn't change. Neither did your mind. But some of you were shocked that you got saved and walked out the altar and you still, still had bad thoughts. It wasn't your mind that changed. It was your spirit. The real you on the inside became brand new. You are born again from the incorruptible seed of the word of God, First Peter says. So your spiritual DNA was based off of the DNA of Jesus when you were born again. That's who you are on the inside. That's why renewing your mind is so important so that you can live out and manifest and walk in what Jesus purchased for you on the cross. Because although you on the inside is all right, if you don't change this and get this in control, you will have no different experience than the unbeliever. When you were born again, this became brand new, and everything on the inside was from God. You are a new creature. Say, I am a new creature. Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision 
availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That word availeth there means has the advantage. If you are a new creature, you have the advantage. Say, I am a new creature, so I have the advantage. You have the advantage in this life. Yes, other people may have more privilege than you, but you have the advantage. So stop letting people tell you what you can do because they say you don't have this privilege. Stop letting people tell you how far you can go because of your gender, because of your background, because of your education, because of your race, because of your nationality, because of your economic status, because of what your parents went through. Stop letting the enemy define you. You have the advantage. Say, I have the advantage. No matter what stands in front of me. And so if you're watching something that continually tells you you don't have the advantage, you're going to lose, and you need to turn it off. Because of what Jesus did, you have the advantage. Don't listen to the voices that tell you you don't. Well, pastor, don't you understand what we're facing? Yes, but you still have the advantage. I didn't say in this life you won't have to face things, but you have the advantage because you're a new creature. So don't limit yourself to what they say you can do, what they say you can achieve, what they say you can have, because they don't get to determine that. Do you know God didn't put any limits on what you can have? He didn't. Look through the scriptures. He didn't say, well, once you hit a million, that's enough. Once you hit a billion, that's enough. Once you have five houses, he didn't put it. He just said, don't let covetousness have you. So don't let someone tell you how much you can have or how long you can live or how healthy you could be or how happy you can be. Don't let the enemy put the limits on your life. Because if he can't get you to walk in sin, he'll try to contain you. Some of you may not be fighting backsliding, you're fighting containment. And the enemy's been holding you back, and you think, well, he'll give you this religious line. Well, you should just be humble. You just be happy with all you got and just be satisfied. Doesn't the Bible say something about that? And then you just agree. You just agree with a little lying imp that's afraid of what you can do. Stop putting the limits on yourself and agree with the culture that will want you limited. Why would this culture want the church strong? Why would a fallen culture want a Holy Ghost-filled individual to increase? Don't let the culture nor the enemy limit you. You serve the Almighty God. His name is El Shaddai, the one who's more than enough. That whenever you come to him, there is a supply. You cannot tap out the supply of God. So if he says, I got more than enough for you all the time, why are you limiting yourself? That's why you have to renew your mind, because some of you heard this taught you in a religious way, saying that you should be limited. But you have to get in the book and realize that's not true. There is no limit on my life. I'm a new creature. I have the advantage. I remember when I would read the scripture as a young teenager, the Lord would show me the scripture using the X-Men about how they were creatures who had powers the world wasn't familiar with. And at any given day, they were stronger than anyone they ever faced. This is who you are in Christ Jesus. You do yourself a disservice to consider yourselves mere men ever again. You're not just humans. You got the Holy Ghost. You're not just humans. You're new creatures. You're not just humans. You've been washed in the blood. You're not just humans. You got the word of God. So stop saying, well, I'm only human. Yeah, before you got saved. But once you made Jesus your Lord, everything changed. And if you resist correctly, the enemy runs from you. Because he's not even in your class. Too many of you glorify the devil. 
Well, look what the devil's doing in these last and evil days. Look what the devil, and then we give the devil free promotion. You share everything he does. You retweet everything he does. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? Why are you publicizing the devil? And then you talk about it. You talk more about what the devil does than what Jesus does. Why are you giving him free publicity? And you're making him bigger in your mind. You're glorifying him in your mind. When who's on the inside of you is greater. Does not the scripture tell us greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world? So we have to start thinking differently. The greater ones inside of me, which is making me greater than anything I'll ever face by association alone. I'm a new creature. I have the advantage. So no matter what shows up on Monday, I have the advantage. And I'm on the winning side. And thanks be to God who always gives me the victory. So although I did not expect this challenge, nor want this challenge, I win. You have to get dogmatic about you having the victory. But no matter what shows up, no matter what they say on the news, no matter what the doctor's report says, I win. It's not over till I win. If I need some extra innings, does not matter. I'm still going to win because my father is the umpire. So stop giving up. Well, it's been so long. Well, keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep resisting. Remember who you are. Some of y'all need a Lion King moment. When Mufasa appeared in the clouds and looked at Simba, remember who you are. We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten what the blood has done. We've forgotten what the Holy Ghost is doing. We've forgotten what the word says we are and says we can have. If we're going to resist correctly, we have to know who we are. You're more than a conqueror through him that loves you. And then he goes on and calls you an ambassador. An ambassador. See, an ambassador has jurisdiction. And see, I, I, I caught up on this TV show recently, Falcon and Winter Soldier. And there's a certain squad of ladies from Wakanda. And someone tried to tell them they didn't have jurisdiction where they were. And they said, wherever we are, we have jurisdiction. They knew who they were. Do you know who you are? Will you let the enemy push you away? Saying you don't have jurisdiction here. You don't have authority here. You can't do this. You can't resist. No. You've been given the authority of the name of Jesus. Use it. You've been given the legal right to use his name. Use it. You are an ambassador. You represent the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven backs your words. So make sure you're speaking what the kingdom says. You're not here to enforce your will. You're here to enforce kingdom policies. And so when the enemy comes against you and comes into your community saying, I'm going to do all this. Excuse me. I'm the ambassador here. I said no. I resist you in the authority of Jesus, whose I am and who I serve. And you resist. Until it changes. You're an ambassador. Say, I'm an ambassador. You must identify correctly. You must represent correctly if you're going to resist. Notice what it says in verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, pastor, how do you identify the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? That is my standing. Doesn't matter what I do, that's my standing. Holiness is our conduct, but righteousness is our standing. Because righteousness is our standing, at any time, we can go through the throne of God and ask for what we want. 
Because righteous is our standing, even when we mess up, even when we sin, we have the right to come to the throne of God and say, I messed up. I blew it. I asked that you forgive me. You can do that because righteousness is your standing. There's nothing you can do to make yourself more righteous or less righteous. When you receive Jesus, you were made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When Jesus went on the cross, he was made sin for you. He who knew no sin was made sin for you so that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you have to see yourself as righteous, not what you struggle with. Too many times in our culture, it's like, well, well, if you're having trouble with lying, you're just a liar. That's not what the Bible says. You're righteous. Well, I'm addicted to weed. You're righteous. I'm addicted to alcohol. You're righteous. If you keep seeing yourself as an addict, you won't experience the full freedom God has for you. If you keep seeing yourself struggling with whatever you're struggling with, you want to experience the freedom God has for you. And this world, I encourage you to embrace the problem. Embrace it. Just identify it. With it. It's okay. It's your truth. No, it's not. It's the deception of hell. Don't take the deception of hell as truth. You resist it. And some of you are resisting things that it's not your fault that you have to. Somebody didn't protect you when you were younger. Somebody didn't do what they should have done by you. It is not your fault, but it is your fight. It is not your fault, but it is your fight. And you must fight the good fight of faith. You must resist the devil. You must overcome whatever throws your way. It's not your fault, but now it is your fight. And if you always dwell on your past, you'll never get to the future God has for you. Yes, what happened to you was unfair and unjust. Well, you serve a God who can heal you, who can restore you, and take you forward. And take you to a place where, yeah, you remember what happened, but that pain associated with it, that trauma associated with it, the darkness associated with it does not have a hold on you anymore. And so you can remember and say, yeah, you know, something like that did happen. But you know what? What God did in me, he can do in you. You are not a slave to your past. God has a glorious future for you. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am a new creature. I have the advantage. I am an ambassador. I have jurisdiction. See, Romans 12, 21 says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. If you're allowing your situation and your struggle to define you, you're in the process of being overcome by evil. So number one, you need to identify correctly. You need to identify correctly. Number two, you need to set your focus. Set your focus. What are you focusing on? What are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the enemy or are you focusing on Jesus? Some of, you, some of us give more attention to the devil than we do to Jesus. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. So begin to bring this to a close. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So, wait, there's weights and sins. We won't get into that today. But I want you to notice about the sin, a sin that so easily besets. What easily besets you is different than what easily besets your neighbor. Everybody has something they fight and they struggle against, but you still can lay it aside. Whatever your struggle or fight is does not define you. It's just something that you need to lay aside. And let us run with patient endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, not the weight, not the sin that so easily besets. 
not who's running next to you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word finisher also means the developer of our faith. He's developing our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising or thinking little of the shame. See, we'll get into this next week. We bought into a culture of shame. That not only did this virus bring fear, it brought shame. That, oh, I caught the virus. I'm ashamed. Why are you ashamed? And so we see a mass worldwide shame. And then it affects other areas. And this shame and fear pushes people to take their lives. Yes, the virus was bad, but the shame and fear it brought was even worse. And then Luke took cancel culture even further. The problem with cancel culture is there's no room for redemption. Aren't you glad God didn't cancel you? Not because of what he heard about you, but because of what he knows about you? So no more shame. See, Jesus bore your shame so you wouldn't have to be ashamed. You might say, well, pastor, don't you know what I did? Does not matter. He bore your shame. He bore your guilt. You're not even guilty. What do you mean, pastor? The Bible says that he died for our sins but was raised for our justification. Justification means to be declared not guilty. So when the father sees you, he says, not guilty. So why should you walk around like you're guilty if the legal decree over your life is not guilty? So you have to understand what 1 John says. The blood has a voice. We knew the blood has voice because Abel's blood cried out. But there's another blood that cries out louder and speaks better things than the voice of Abel's blood. It is the blood of Jesus that's over your life that cries out, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. You see, in the old covenant, when the lepers came in, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. But there's blood over your life that declares out, they're clean, they're clean, they're clean. You are not guilty and you shouldn't be ashamed. And I sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied or tired or faint in your minds. So focus on Jesus. Number three, feed on the word. As first Peter says, as babes desire the sensual milk of the word, set aside all those other things and go after the word of God. We've been feeding on the wrong things. Feeding on things that have been telling us that we're held back, feeding on things that tell us that never change, feeding on things that tell us it's just going to get worse for us. We have to feed on the word of God if we're going to overcome the challenges that are in front of us. Yes, the challenges are real. But if we feed on the word, we can overcome the challenges. But if we feed on the dauntiness of the giant in front of us, we'll be afraid and never confront it. Number four, remember who your enemy is. Remember who your enemy is. And here's how is a good sign that you've forgotten who your enemy is. If you begin to make statements like, well, all white people, all black people, all Mexican people, all this, all that, all police, all politicians, when you start talking like that, you have forgotten who your enemy is. And you also showcase your ignorance. All people, nothing. Here's what you say about all people. All people are people and act like people and you is a people. So just like you have your ways, all people have their ways. So stop buying into a life and say, well, all people this, all people that. Stop. Do you want to be categorized like that? Aren't you an individual? So don't give in to the lie of the enemy that tells you all these things that are all people like this. Because now you're going to walk around with a chip on your shoulder. And as soon as one of those all people you categorize does something, you say, see, I knew all people. What if they were having a bad day? Or what if they're just a jerk to everybody? But now you are unfairly or unrighteously judging a whole group of people. 
And whenever you judge unrighteously, you set yourself up to receive the same judgment. Remember who your enemy is. Ephesians 6.12 tells us it is the devil and his kingdom. Yes, people can yield to the devil, but make sure you don't yield to him with your mouth and your emotions. How can you resist him if you agree with what he has to say? If he's telling you all people this, and he said, yeah, all people this, you can't resist him because now you agree with him. I'm very well-versed in history, right? I'm aware of history, but there's some movies I'm not going to watch. I don't need a reminder. I, I. Look, this is not a rule. This is the same what the Holy Ghost told me to tell you. This is just me. I'm not watching another slave movie. I can't. I know what it will do to me. So because I protect my soul and what I want to manifest in my life, I'm not watching that. Again. Is it a sin to watch it? No. But I know me. So I've set boundaries over my life, over my eyes, over my ears, so I can manifest what I need to manifest on this earth. Because now I'm watching stuff. I need to make sure, okay, whoa, what is this going to do to my family? What is it going to do to my church? I need to put boundaries over what I receive so I can be who God wants me to be in the earth. And so there are different boundaries you need to set over your life that are not necessarily thus say of the Lord or thus say of Scripture, but because you know yourself. And some bound you are just wise. You don't need to be calling him after midnight. You have no business calling her after midnight. You ain't trying to pray. You ain't talking about worship and praise. You're talking about something else. Set boundaries over your life. Running out of time. Number five. Forgive everybody of everything. As Ephesians 4.31 and 32 tell us, forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. Because once you realize who your real enemy is, you can't stay mad at people. You have to forgive them. You have to let it go. Because whatever you decide to not forgive, and stay in offense towards. You've made that situation your master. You've made that situation your Lord. You've decided to serve the unforgiveness. And now your life is hindered because you won't let it go. That's why you always hear me tell you, forgive everyone of everything. That has to be out of your mouth consistently. So when you need to forgive somebody, is when the first thing that pops out of your mouth. I forgive everybody of everything. I'm not giving the enemy an open door to hold me back. Unforgiveness will shut down your faith. Unforgiveness will shut down your faith. And it will keep you from being able to resist the enemy. I remember Dad Hagen told the story about a person he ministered to, has to be now 90 years ago maybe 80 years ago, and they were having these certain issues with their, in their child, there's certain things that would happen to them, and the doctors couldn't solve it, the doctors couldn't fix it, and it turns out it was an evil spirit driving it. Not all diseases are driven by evil spirit, but this one was. And so they came to Dad Hagen, it was an old family friend, asked Dad Hagen and his wife to come to the house and pray. And when he was about to pray for the young lady, the Lord showed him that the mom had unforgiveness towards someone in her family. And I said, that's how this is happening in your house. I'll pray. But once you deal with this, it can't happen anymore. So the mom forgave that person. And she said that thing tried to come on her daughter one more time. And she said no, and it hasn't been back. And Dad Hagen went to visit them years later, and they were enjoying the freedom that God had for them. But the door was open for that to happen in the first place, the unforgiveness. Can I ask you a question? What is in your life because you won't forgive? What's in your life because you won't forgive? Forgive that parent, that grandparent, that ex-spouse, that teacher, that ex-friend, that politician, that president, that governor, that group of people you blame for everything. 
how forgiveness works that way too. What is in your life because you refuse to forgive? And what will leave your life as soon as you make the decision to forgive? Romans 12, let me finish here. I'm going to pick up next week. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with everybody. If it's possible, as much as you have in you, live at peace with everybody. Well, Pastor, whatever it's not possible, then stop hanging out with them. Set boundaries. Nope, 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 nope. I have to keep peace. Jesus wants me to walk in peace with everybody. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Number six, I'll stop here and pick it up next week. Number six, have faith in the vengeance of God. Have faith in the vengeance of God. Stop saying, well, they're just going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. Seed time and harvest still works. Have faith in the vengeance of God. You do what is right. You forgive everyone. You love your enemies. You bless those who cuss you out. And you put your faith in God to make it right. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 18, 7 through 8. We looked at this a few weeks ago. And shall not God avenge vindicate his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with them, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Have faith in the vengeance of God. Stop taking things into your own hands. You do what the Bible tells you to do. And yes, it may be an issue that bothers you to court as unfair as unjust. But you say, Father, I roll this over to you. I cast this care, this worry, and anxiety upon you. And I believe for you to avenge me and vindicate me in this matter. I'm not going to touch it in my mind anymore. I'm not going to stress about it anymore. I've given it to you. I'm leaving it alone. I'm going to do what you told me to do. Have faith in the vengeance of God. He will step in. What we talked about all last week, and I heard you heard me mention at the beginning of this message. When you make a stand for God, expect supernatural assistance. And sometimes that comes in the forms of vengeance. God will avenge you. Don't get in his way. Stand to your feet. So close your eyes as you stand to your feet. I need you to search throughout your heart. What are some things you need to let go? Who are some people you need to forgive? What are some things you need to get right? What are some areas you need to start to resist in? You search your heart right now. Between you and God, get honest, get raw, real before the throne of God right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. And if you need to ask God to forgive you for some things, go ahead. If you need to forgive others for some things, you go ahead and do that. You need to let some things go. Go ahead and do that. You need to roll some things over in him, some things you're beginning to take into your own hands. You go ahead and do that. And put your faith in God's ability to step in and release supernatural assistance and even vengeance if it calls for that. Put your faith in this, that God is God and he can get involved in your so, Father, I pray over every single person under the sound of my voice in this room, at home, online, at their offices, in their cars, as your presence increases in their lives. I ask for your glory to minister to them, to show them what you have for them, and encourage them even further to what you have for them. And this year of winning, this year of victory. And Father, I pray as they make these decisions to forgive and go forward, I pray for your healing power to hit their bodies from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. 
that things that have been holding on to them would just suddenly fall off. The chains would suddenly fall off. In the name of Jesus. Thanks for watching today. We hope today's message was a blessing to you that it empowered you to make Jesus famous in every area of your life. Hey, if you want to be a part of what God's doing here at Faith, you know, our vision statement is to ignite an awakening that impacts Georgia and influences the world through the power of the love of Jesus. And we'd love for you to be a part. You can find out our different experience times and our different locations by going to FCCGA.com. If you want to give, you can text FCCGA to 73256. You can also go to FCCGA.com to give online and be a part of what God's doing here. We'd love to see you anytime you're in our area. We believe God has something good just for you. And anytime you come to our Faith Experience, we believe you will experience God and His plan for your life. So thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.